everyone and welcome to our, another webinar at the Lancaster Investment and Finance Society Summer Academy. Um, today we're going to cover how to pick a stock and uh, today I'm joined here by James Jason who is the president of the Lancaster Investment and Finance Society. Hello, um, yeah, so thank you, Ben. Um, I'll be assisting Ben today with the key metrics ratio and um, hopefully trying to impart as much wisdom as we can to, um, to as many students as we can during this period. So thanks, Ben. So uh, before we get started, if you're watching it through recording, um, my email's at the bottom right. And if you have any questions, just email me. Um, and that's that. So. Before we get started, I just want to mention uh, our sponsor is Jefferies. Jefferies is an international investment bank. Um, they do several internships, such as spring weeks and summer internships. Uh, if you want to find out more, please visit jefferies.com for more information. Um, so we're going to kick off uh, our webinar, first of all, with uh, what we kind of use to uh, find stocks. So a basic uh, system that you can use to find a stock based on certain criteria is a filter, a stock screener or a filter. And what that basically is, um, let's say I wanted to find types of uh, videos on YouTube. Let's say I wanted to find funny cat videos on YouTube. I can filter out certain combinations such as how long the video should be, it has cats in it, what kind of is in the title, etc. And you can do the same thing with stocks. I can uh, filter out, for example, how much money the company makes, where it's based, how big the company is, how much dividend it pays, etc. And throughout this presentation, we'll go through the kind of details of the fundamentals or, or kind of numerical side of looking at a uh, an equity or a stock and explain to you what kind of things we look at when we are choosing a stock. So we'll come back to the screen in a minute uh, once we understand how the different criteria work. But first, we'll go, uh, go on to a uh, company overview. So here we have Boeing, and right now the terminal that I am using is Thomson Reuters Aicon. Um, there is other providers available such as Bloomberg, but even if you uh, want to just use Google, you can go on Yahoo Finance, for example, where you can get an overview of a stock. Um, and any kind of screen, uh, any kind of provider you go on, such as Bloomberg or Yahoo Finance, you will have an overview such as I have here. Now, an overview will contain several kind of metrics, numbers, and graphs uh, telling you the important basic information of the stock. I'm just going to point out a few things for, for Boeing and kind of what, what they mean. So some of the things I quickly have a look at is the year to date, and that basically tells me how much the stock price has changed this year. So starting from January the 1st in 2020, uh, and how high the stock price is at now, how much has it changed? Okay, and as you can see, Boeing is doing pretty badly, down 46%. Um, another thing I look at is beta. I'm not going to go into detail with this, but it's basically a number that tells me relative to the benchmark, such as the S&P 500 or the FTSE 100, how does the stock react? Which way, which direction will it go? And how by how much? Market cap, that's basically telling me how big the company is. Uh, for Boeing, it's $99 billion. So it's a relatively big company. It's important to look at the size of the company for your investment because if it's a smaller company, they are more risky and more volatile usually. Whereas a big and stable company such as Boeing are expect less likely to fail or go bankrupt and uh, usually are more stable of an investment. Um, other other parts I look at. I mean, there's a lot of information relative to kind of news and events, which is very qualitative. Uh, parts of of the information, um, so that's that's very basic. So any you can read the news on on any details that come out. It's more short term that you look at. Um, you can you can look at uh, multiples. These are basically ratios that are kind of related. You can compare to other companies. So these are these are metrics that you use to compare to other companies. Um, you can look at the recommendations by analysts. So what experts think of this stock? Should you invest in it or not? And the rest of it, these are these are mainly mainly uh, made by Reuters. These are kind of different uh, metrics that Reuters makes for you that you can use as numbers, which I'm not going to go into too much detail with. Instead, we're going to go straight to the income, uh, the financial statements of the companies. And uh, you will have heard that there's three uh, major financial statements uh, that you use 
when you are looking at a company. And the first one that I usually look at is the income statement. If it lets me sign in. Okay. There we go. So, income statement. There we go. So, the income statement basically tells me uh, per year or per quarter um, how much money the company is making, and it is broken down into separate parts as to where each uh, of the money has gone. So, starting with revenue, that's just basically how much money the company has made in that time. And we go all the way to the net income, which is the money left over after I've paid for everything related to producing and selling that product. Um, so, to start off with, um, we have revenue and then we go to gross profit. Now, going to gross profit, that the, the basically cost of goods sold, the cost of revenue relates to how much you kind of spend on the basic production of, of the goods. So just producing the product. So let's say I'm producing iPhones. This cost includes the raw materials of the iPhone and the labor that goes into producing it. So the people working at the factory and the cost of kind of maintaining those robots that produce the iPhone. Then we go on to uh, costs that are in a sense indirect or kind of uh, outside of the basic production of the good. And they can be categorized into selling general and admin expenses. So that's related to, for example, when I make my iPhone, I need to have someone marketing the iPhone, someone distributing the iPhone, so I'm making sure you know, there's buyers for the iPhone and making sure, for example, that there's the regulatory label for the iPhone is done. So it's more uh, it's more administrative parts of the sale that are included in those costs. Research and development is very important because you want to produce kind of new goods. And not every company actually undertakes research and development, but it's it's very good way to grow your company and and make it more profitable and and uh, have a better return for investors. Um, and then I'm not going to go into too much detail for the rest of it. The only thing that you want to keep an eye on uh, out of here is the unusual expense. Um, and this can be anything that is not year to year standard in their uh, kind of money flows or, or uh, cash flows. So this can be, for example, a big fine, uh, something controversial, maybe a new regulation brought in place, something that's a one off payment that you, you, you don't expect to happen again. And it's important to keep an eye on this because if there's a big number here or something that you don't expect to be here, then you need to read into the company's news and information to find out what that was. Because if there's been, for example, a big scandal, then you need to be aware of that because your investment might not be uh, as, as safe as you think it is. Um, even if they try to uh, hide it using a thing called creative accounting, uh, you might still need to look into detail just in case. Um, there is some kind of risk that you haven't noticed. Um, then we get to operating income um, or, or EBIT. And that's basically everything that I have left. So I've taken everything out of the equation except for interest and taxes. Okay, that's the two things that I haven't taken out. The reason for this is because interest doesn't get taxed. And then tax is the final thing that I uh, take off. Okay. So first of all, I'll get rid of the interest. The interest is basically how much I'm paying uh, for, for, for my loans, etc. And then I have my tax at the end, um, which, which again, I just have a certain uh, corporate tax that I have to pay. Now, one thing to mention with taxes, uh, tax can be deferred, um, such as using uh, accounting methods, such as occur occurring. And basically that means your kind of payments, etc., get moved a year. So kind of deferring the payment that you have to make. Important note here is your company needs to be growing for this to be possible. So a high growth company such as Tesla can defer its taxes. And that means they won't, like, let's say in the US, you have to pay 21% tax. That's the corporate tax rate. Tesla won't actually be paying 21%. It will be more like 15% because they're deferring. But as the company gets mature and slows down in its growth, that 21% will be reached and the tax rate will normalize to the corporate tax rate because there's only so much you can defer in for so long. And then finally, um, in, in Reuters, we have a section for net income before extraordinary items and net income, which is after extraordinary, uh, extraordinary items. 
Um, again, this is related to extraordinary expenses, things that you don't expect to be spent again. And usually if I'm modeling or, or running uh, some kind of a numerical example of this, then I would use before extraordinary items uh, simply because the extraordinary items might change the number uh, very highly. But in overall, throughout the years, that extraordinary event might not occur again. So it, it depends on what you prefer to use there. Now, financial statements will have footnotes. Basically, this is other information included as outside of the main kind of uh, information that you are given. OK, an example of this is, for example, normalized EBIT or EBITDA. And that basically means um, the number that you get here is going to be slightly different to what you have up there in the operating and net income, simply because this takes into account the extraordinary spending and normalizes it. So again, this is very useful for modeling because you get a more realistic number of, of what you expect throughout the years and it, it gives you a better picture of how the company is doing. Um, just to mention, there's there's a lot of the footnotes that data, extra data that you can look at here. Um, a website that you can use for American companies, so public listed US companies, is the US Securities and Exchange Commission, the sec.gov website. And what you can do here is, and this is free, you can type in a ticker. So for example, the Boeing that we're looking at has a ticker of BA. And it comes up with every single document that the BA has filed. Now, I want to go for a type document called 10K. 10K is basically a document they have to file every year that contains the the company's uh, financial statements. So for they last filed in January 31st, and I can go on interactive data. I can actually look at the original documents, but interactive data is a bit more easy to navigate through. And if I go on notes to financial statements, I actually have a list of a lot of different uh, kind of information that I can access that you won't see in the standard financial statements. One of the ones that I usually look at is investments. Investments is important because here I can see um, which companies they are invested in. So this means there's either companies that they've joined with or they have a certain amount of stake in, certain ownership. Okay. Um, for example, uh, Boeing has a 50% ownership in the United Launch Alliance. Okay, United Launch Alliance is still a separate company, but Boeing is 50% of it. So 50% of it is technically Boeing. So these things you've got to look at because when you're investing in a stock like Boeing, I'm investing in Boeing, but then I'm also investing in such as United Launch Alliance, which they own. So that way you can kind of see where their money is going. And this is important, for example, if you have a company investing in something controversial. So I say Boeing was investing in something that's that's not, for example, ESG, so not ethically right, let's say oil or something, okay? Then, um, you know, your, your investment might be more risky than you expected it because they're invested in, in, in certain areas. And then one day maybe you have a news flash pop up about Boeing being invested in, in a, an investment that's, that's not good for the environment, for example. That's going to drive your stock price down. So these are kind of the qualitative sides of your investment that you need to look at and keep an eye on. So make sure you always check the notes to financial statements or the footnotes because they contain a lot of secrets that you don't get to see in the basic financial statements. I'm going to quickly go through balance sheet and cash flows, but I'm not going to go into too much detail because, again, um, we're not going to be focusing on this today. We're going to go on to key metric ratios, which I think is, is more important. But um, if you want to, you know, go through this in detail and find out every single part of the financial statements, the balance sheet, income statement and cash flows, I recommend you go on the uh, SEC website that I was on just there. And as you're going through it, so let's say for Boeing, I go on the income statement. As you're going through it, let's say I don't understand something here. Just Google it and see the details of each line and what they mean. OK, um, so moving on to the balance sheet for Boeing. Um, the balance sheet is is a snapshot of uh, what they kind of have at the moment. So, for example, assets which are uh, tangible uh, and intangible. So, at the moment, let's say they have a factory. The factory is worth X amount. Let's say a thousand, hundred thousand pounds. Then, at the moment, they have a hundred thousand pounds worth of asset. Okay. Um, let's say next year that factory is only worth ninety thousand. Then they have ninety thousand worth of assets. So, it's just a snapshot at the moment in time. 
not quite like the financial uh, the income statement which is a, a the amount of money that they generated over the time this is just right now this moment in time how much how much is something's worth uh, a balance sheet is called the balance sheet because it's balances on one side you have the assets and uh yeah you have the assets and the other side you have the liabilities and shareholders equity and if you look here the total assets one three three thousand is the same as liability and shareholders equity one three three thousand okay um i'm not gonna i'm not gonna go step by step here but uh the current assets are basically assets that are, are right now so less than a year they can be used in so for example cash you can use the, that's going to be used in less than a year inventory you're going to sell most of your inventory in less than a year whereas intangible um long-term assets uh, such as properly plant and equipment let's, let's say a factory or a machinery that you're going to have that around for a long time so they're classified as long-term assets which are around for longer time um and long long-term assets tend to be depreciated that means for example let's say you buy a car a car is going to be worth less and less over the years. That's called depreciation when it loses value. Another thing that exists that is similar to depreciation is amortization. That basically relates to intangible assets. So assets that you can't touch. Um, and as an example of this, for example, is let's say a loan. Okay, you might have heard of a thing called amortization schedule. And what that is, is basically um, if you know how a loan works, you have a loan and over the time you pay pay the interest on the loan but then also you pay a principal which is basically slowly paying back the loan okay and in that schedule so in amortization that loan is in in a way losing its value for you okay so you have less and less money from that loan that's what amortization is basically you're kind of decreasing the amount of money that you own and the same goes for intangible assets so for example let's say your reputation let's say you launch a new campaign or a uh, new advertisement or something okay that obviously at first is going to have a lot of attraction but over the years it's going to lose its attraction because less and less people will be viewing it okay so that's it's amortization can be very um, wishy-washy and kind of come out of nowhere or or just uh, like empty lines no tangible thing behind it but it is important because things do tend to lose value uh, just as physical things um, intangible things lose value as well over time so it's important to include that and it's important to look at because it can change your uh, income and company's performance quite a bit um, so yeah and then again for, for balance sheet also have footnotes so these are again information that are not directly included in the financial statements to look at. and you can do the same thing on the SEC website to look at that finally cash flows um, keep getting logged out of of Thomson Reuters. Sorry about that. So ca cash flow statement is basically um, what it sounds like is how is my cash moving? So if I'm getting cash coming in, that's a positive number. Cash is going out, that's usually a negative number. Okay, so it's how is it moving around in the company that I'm uh, running? And there's three main parts to it. There's the I can just go on it actually, I'll show you. Yeah, so we have cash flow from operations, investing, and cash flow from financing. Okay, so they're separated into different activities that you do. Um, it's very important to understand how cash flow statements work and what they mean because in the cash flow statement, it's very hard to hide information. So in the income statement, you can put a lot of things into the other section. You can call it uh, an expected expense, whatever. You can you can occur it. You can move it to next year. You can play around with the numbers. Call it creative accounting or whatnot. But in the in a cash flow statement, you can't. Cash is king. That's what they say, and it is because the flows of cash you can't hide. You you have to exactly say what where the cash has moved, and you can spot a lot of red flags in the cash flow statement. There's a sudden move in cash somewhere that you don't expect to happen. And again, I recommend you go through the a cash flow statement on the SEC website and find out uh, more about it. So now we're going to move on to the key metric ratios, which will hopefully make uh, for you make it easier to uh, understand how uh, kind of 
the the income statements or the financial statements interact with each other and also it makes it a lot easier to spot red flags throughout all three income statements the financial state i keep saying <laughs> financial statements um instead of having to look for each one separately okay so uh james do you want to kick us off with uh profitability sure. uh margins that's all fine um thanks ben um feel free to um use a chat ben by the way just to summarize anything i've said you know any keywords what like i've done so far so feel free to do that continue doing that um, I'm just going to make a start with some of the prof 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 yeah, profitability ratios that, that we use um, within the industry. So the first one that I'm going to start with is gross profit margin. This basically shows a percentage of revenues that exceeds a company's cost of goods, cost of goods sold. So this illustrates how well, say, for instance, a company is generating profits before deducting selling and other administration costs. You know, the profitability ratio that includes selling and administration costs is net profit margin, which I'll cover in the next um, ratio. So um, basically what this is, is that a lot of the ratios that we are discussing are used to assess the financial health of a firm. Now, what does this ratio tell you? For instance, if the gross profit changes very significantly year on year, it's, 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 a, say, it's a telltale sign that the company A has either poor management practices or B, shitty products. But apart from that, I think, you know, people shouldn't really jump to these two conclusions, as I've mentioned, because it may be due to operational changes to the business model or factors beyond company control. And I think we could all name a factor beyond company control at this point in time. So that's the gross margin. And that's calculated by revenue minus cost of goods sold divided by revenue. So that's how you calculate revenue, um, gross margin. Now, um, as Ben mentioned earlier, we talked a little bit about EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation and amortization. Now, again, this is a, you know, it's a common measurement of the company's profit used in investment banking, as it doesn't factor in financing decisions and accounting treatments or tax environments. It enables the bank to have a greater perspective of the condition of the firm. EBITDA strips all of the different accounting um, treat methods that each company uses as it varies on a company to company, industry to industry basis. So the investment bank can make a decision. A measure of a company's operate, it's a measure of a company's pro uh, operating profit as a percentage of its revenue and allows for a comparison of one's company's of one company's real performance to others in the industry. So it's really good for sort of um, peer analysis within within the same industry. Now, sorry, James, just to pause for a sec. Um, sure. Just to mention, we're going to be sending out a document to those watching this live with the details of all this. So uh, you'll get to recap all this. If you're watching the recording, then email me. You can see me the email at the start of the video and I'll send you the document that we're using. Thanks, Ben. So um, the next thing that I want to cover following on from EBITDA margin is operating margin. And that follows on just after that, where we start to include costs such as operating expenses, including, you know, selling and other administration costs. So um, as you can see, we're slowly making our way down that income statement. Now, again, this in indicates how much of a dollar, dollar, dollars worth of revenues is left over after both the um, cost of goods sold and operating expenses and depreciation and amortization. It's also known as the, uh, the EBIT margin. So um, before we had the EBITDA margin and now we have the EBIT margin, which is also called operating margin. Now, the next thing that I want to cover, and I think, um, Ben, I think you, I, I didn't see the screen, but, I, I, but I'm sure that you covered the calculation, which was operating profit divided by revenue times 100. So that's how you would calculate operating margin. Perfect. Thanks. So um, the next thing that I'm going to cover is the pre-tax margin. Pre-tax profit basically includes the cost of goods sold, operating expenses, as well as interest expense. And this measure uh, also considers the company's use of leverage. By leverage, what I mean is debt to um, you know, purchase assets or fi finance activity in, in a sort of in layman's terms. And you know, pre-tax marg margin, the pre-tax margin is basically the amount per dollar of profit um, a company um, has generated before deducting taxes. The pre-tax profit margin is sometimes preferred over the regular profit margin as tax expenditures can make profitability comparisons between companies misleading. They are less effective when comparing, you know, this ratio is less effective when comparing companies from other sectors as each in industry generally has different operating expenses and sales patterns. So you need to really take that into consideration when using different, you know, ratios. Some are specific. Some are really, really good for peer analysis, where others are just good for peer analysis within a certain industry. 
So um, the next thing that I'm going to cover is the effective tax rate. And that is fairly straightforward. It's income tax divided by pre-tax income times 100. Now, for corporations, the effective corporate tax rate is the rate that they pay on their pre-tax profits. The effective tax rate typically refers only to federal income tax, but it can be computed to reflect an individual's or a company's total tax burden. Um, the next thing that I'm going to cover is the net so, margin. Sorry, James, sorry yeah, sure. Quickly, so, um, this effective tax rate, if you remember, I mentioned how companies defer the tax payments that they make. So this effective tax rate bills basically will usually be less than that 21% for US companies because they'll be deferring their taxes and so paying less of the taxes and then the corporate tax rate. But then as we go over time, um, as the company becomes bigger, this effective tax rate will tend towards the corporate tax rate because companies are able to defer less. So this is something you're going to keep an eye on. And to be fair, it's good if the ta effective tax rate is lower because the company is making more profit. But then obviously the happy times won't last forever. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks, Bob. So um, the next thing that I'm going to cover, you know, as you as as I've mentioned, we're now making our way towards the bottom end of the income statement, or at least the important stuff of the in income statement, which is, you know, we're factoring in other more and more costs now. So this fi this final thing, this final profitability ratio that I'm going to cover is called a net margin, and this is the percentage of revenue remaining after all operating expenses, interest, taxes, and preferred stock dividends, but not common stock dividends, which I'm sure we'll cover. Later later on have been deducted from a company's total revenue. So in simple terms, this is basically after the majority of all costs or nearly all of them. So um, and how much is left. So it's so basically how we calculate this is after tax profits divided by revenues times by 100. So um, so should I um, make a start on the um, dew point ratios, earnings ratios? Um, so yeah, I'll, 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 do, I'll do the We'll do we'll alternate. We'll alternate. Sure, okay. that's fine. That's fine. No worries. Um, okay. So asset turnover is very basic. Um, it's basically compared to my revenue, how much assets I have. So you divide revenues by average total assets. What I'm trying to look at here is um, how efficient I am with my assets. So think of it this way. Let's say I have a load of machines and I'm making money from my selling my iPhones. OK, I want to use those machines as best as possible to generate as much revenue as I can. Okay, so this number I would really want to be above one. Okay, so I want my machines to be producing uh, more than they are worth themselves. Okay, so making me more money than they're worth themselves. So if, if I can be very efficient with my machinery with the amount of assets I own and produce a lot of money, then I'm, I'm really efficient and good company. As you can see with Boeing, this number is actually pretty low and it will depend on which industry you're looking at and airplane production, it's not very efficient because it takes a very long time to make an airplane and when it's something that's batch production, so you're making a lot of little things, let's say iPhones is you know probably one of those, you're producing a lot over like really quickly with machinery, you can become very efficient. So I buy that machine and I can produce thousands of iPhones with it and I can make a lot of money with it. Sure. So, yeah. Just to add, just yeah. Sorry. Out. Just to add to that, Ben. Um, you know, as you said, I think it's a it's a great ratio to use. You know, to use within companies within the same industry. You know, because you know the the ratio can vary um, between industries. Industries, for instance, consumer staples. They have small asset bases, but you know, really, really high average asset turnover ratios. Whereas, co you know, companies like you know real estate, utilities, and as you said, you know, aircrafts, you know, aviation. They have very, very large asset bases, but low asset tur turnover ratio. So therefore, I would not advise you to use this ratio to compare companies in different industries. And, um, you know, I think on this ratio, it does say average total assets. And you won't find this calculation within the income statement. You'll find this in the balance sheet, also known as the statement of financial position. If you could write that in the chat so that people know better if that's OK. Um, but yeah, you would find the information for the total assets on the balance sheet. And that is, and the average total assets are calculated by beginning assets plus ending assets divided by two. Okay, um, so pre-tax margin we've done. So that we do want to do ROA. I think you're muted, James. 
Perfect. Um, basically, the return on assets is how much profit is generated per dollar of assets. You know, it gives analysts a greater idea as to how efficient a company's management is utilizing its assets. You know, ROA, similar to the previous ratio, is best used when comparing similar companies or comparing a company to its previous performance. Now, um, the way that we calculate this is um, just getting that. Up is pre-tax income divided by average total assets times 100. And as I mentioned earlier, average total assets, you find that in the balance sheet and you add beginning plus ending and you divide that by two. Okay. Um, asset to equity um, or leverage, that's that's very basic. It's basically how much assets I have compared to how much kind of people have invested in my company. Um, this can this will depend on uh, what how you want to kind of invest. So. Um, it's important to keep an eye on this and, and have this number as high as, sorry, yeah, as high as possible because um, you want to have your investment covered by assets, okay? I'd rather put my money into assets or physical things such as cars, factories, whatever, rather than debt, which is very risky. And you're basically, if you're investing in a company that's just basically made of debt, then you're, you're basically just paying for loans, basically just investing in loans and you're you're paying for the interest on them. You're not really investing in any growth or any value. So you want to have your investment covered more by assets than debt. Okay, so that's that's one thing to mention there. ROE, James? Yeah, so the return on equity is basically a measure of financial performance calculated by dividing the net income by the shareholders equity. And this is because the shareholders' equity is equal to a company's assets minus its debt. The ROE is um, considered the return on net assets, and it's also it's it's also considered a measure by um, by by basically the, the measure is is how effectively management is using a company's assets to create profits for its shareholders. And um, yeah, yeah, sorry. Sorry, um, whether an ROE is considered satisfactory, again, will depend on what is normal for the industry or company peers. So the industry may have, um, you know, an average ROE and, and you need to use that as a benchmark to compare rather than using a blanket benchmark from another industry. So it really needs to be specific to an industry or company peers. And Ben, you wanted to add to that? Yeah, so we have two ROEs, we have pre-tax and ROE. Oh, yeah, sure. It's basically, you know, if, if we include tax in it or not, mm -hmm. um, so that's the only difference. Yeah, yeah. This this will all be covered in the document anyway. Um, Pre-tax ROE and normal ROE. One is before taxes and one is um, after taxes, as Ben said. So, um, I think, what is the, um, should we cover earnings retention as well? Yeah, so I'll do this quickly. Um, sure. Earnings retention reinvestment rates are, are related, okay? Um, earnings retention is basically uh, once I've taken everything away from my spending, so basically the net income I've got left over is, how much of that money do I keep for myself and how much of that money do I pay out, okay? Uh, I'll start with payout. Payout can either be uh, giving dividends to your investors. So that's kind of periodic usually for companies. They uh, give a certain amount of money depending on how much stocks you own. Or they can do share buybacks, which is becoming more and more popular, where they basically buy certain shares at a certain price and that means it reduces the amount of shares that are outstanding which drives off everyone else's shares okay so it's, it's a win-win for everyone and a company has more control because there's less shares outstanding so it's a win-win for everyone and then more and more companies are using it okay now the other side of the picture so my earnings retention so much money i'm keeping for myself um that's a good thing as well okay so What's important to remember here is you don't just want companies giving out all the money to the investors because you want the company to also invest in itself so that it's growing, okay? So that it keeps growing because uh, companies such as airlines, for example, if you look at it now, they've been giving out a lot of their money uh, to investors, not really investing in themselves. Now we have COVID-19 come along and all the airlines were struggling, not making money and now they have to go to the government for help instead if they retain those earnings invested in themselves or even just put it aside and put it into a, a risk-free investment such as a bond now they would have that money and they would not have any problems they could be able to carry on in, in, in a risk environment the opposite end of that is for example apple who has something like seven trillion dollars in uh, banks and 
uh, government bonds uh, as cash so that in case something bad happens, they've got plenty of money to cover the company's value multiple times. Okay, so that's why you want a uh, high earnings retention. Uh, but it depends on the company. So if it's a if it's a young company, the earnings retention will be even higher because they need they probably won't uh, they'll retain everything and then reinvest in themselves so that they keep growing. Mature company they can afford to pay out a lot more to investors. Now. Out of this, we can also look at a reinvestment rate, so how much of that money they reinvest in themselves, okay? So I can either choose to reinvest that money that I've retained into the company, or I can just pay it out as bonuses, as wages, as whatnot. So again, give it away just to the company itself, okay? Again, you want you want to have the company to reinvest in itself as much as possible so that company keeps growing, etc. Uh, but then also you, you want to have some of the payments given to the employees or whatnot as bonuses so that you know there's there's good morale and the company keeps going well now sometimes this number can be very high so as you can see there's 600 percent there that's because the company reinvests in itself using extra loans outside of its uh, earnings retention um and just to mention uh, earnings retention reinvestment rates plays a key part in calculating the growth rate when you do valuation of companies, which is a very important factor in determining if it's a good investment. So it's a, it's a very important to keep an eye on this as well. Do you want to do quick ratios, James? Sure, I'll be able to cover that. Um, basically, the quick ratio measures a company's ability to meet its very short term obligations with its most liquid assets. By liquid, mean we mean you know ease in terms of converting to cash. That's what we mean by liquidity. How easy we can convert an asset into cash. Now, if some, now if something major major happens, say something that's even worse to worse than COVID, or um, perhaps like um, I don't know, it's unable to meet its, uh, you know, it's found out from its auditors that it needs to meet its obligations very very quickly. Um, the quick ratio is basically a quick way to sort of um, determine how well the company is poised to meet these very, very short term obligations within 24 hours. And this is calculated by current assets minus inventory divided by current liabilities. And again, this information is not found on the income statement, but it's found on the balance sheet. Yeah. And just to mention, we, they also sometimes call the quick ratio asset test. They call it asset test because um, if I was going to go bust right now, this moment, in one day, so this moment in time, how how much of my stuff can I sell? Okay, so if if the quick ratio is high, that means I can cover my own company in one day very fast. So for example, Apple would be able to cover itself in one day with all the cash they have very quickly. Uh, whereas Boeing, if they went bust in in today and they would have to you know cover themselves today, they'd be in big trouble. Um, current ratio, same story, except we don't take away inventory, so. This, this is uh, more of a ratio looking at the company, how much they can cover themselves if they were going to go bust for, for the outlook, like let's say in a year. Okay, So they have more time to kind of sell their assets, their factory, their cars, whatever. Um, so Boeing would be all right to uh, pay off its investors in that sense. So it would be a long long term. It's, an, it's, a, it's, a, it's a safe investment. You could say that. Do you want to do uh, times interest earned? Sure. Um, basically, times interest earned is calculated by earnings before um, before interest and tax EBIT divided by interest expense. It's basically how much uh, profit before interest and taxes can cover the interest expense. So it's usually, uh, you know, in the form of a multiple. So, um, for instance, you know, five times, 10 times, 12 times. So, you know, our earnings can cover interest expense, you know, 12 times. So that's that's basically what this is. And it's a measure of a company's ability to honor its debt payments. Thank you. Um, oh, do you want to do cash cycle as well? Because I yeah, sure. I'll I'll do that. So, um, cash cycle is um, basically the time period from when a business pays cash to its suppliers for inventory and receives cash from its customers. And again, this varies on an industry to industry basis. Um, for instance, um, you know, in consumer staples or like Tesco. For instance, they pay, they, they receive the goods from their suppliers um, very quickly. However, when they pay them back, uh, you know, it may, it may be months down the line. So this is basically how quickly, this is a measure of how quickly a company converts, um, you know, it's, you know, it's sales into cash or, you know, it's cycle into cash as soon as possible. Yeah. And, 
Do you have anything to add to that, Ben? Uh, it's a very accounting perspective. This. Yeah. Um, yeah. Look at the operating. We're not actually going to cover most of these because they are kind of mm -hmm. accounting perspectives. And I don't really, when I'm investing, I don't look at those at all. It's kind of very short term. So it's, it's in a sense irrelevant to my investment. Um, asset to equity we've covered. Debt to equity, very basic. How much debt do I have relative to my equity? Um, you use this number uh, very often in calculating your beta, which uh, which we use in calculating our cost of equity, which you'll probably hear about more when we're doing our uh, modeling and discounted cash flow workshops. But basically, this number uh, will depend on the industry that you're working in. So some companies might have to have higher debt, some companies might have to have lower debt. Okay. Now, it's important to have debt because uh, it's just a way of raising money but you don't want too much debt because then you're basically just investing in loans as an investor uh, you want a uh, kind of a fine balance between the two so that your company can keep growing keep paying the investors but then also have value in it and not just made up of loans i'm just going to quickly cover gearing as well um or long-term debt to capital the gearing ratio basically tells me how much of the company is made up of debt um and for example here the a lot of uh a lot of the company says it's, it's 105 percent a lot of it is is debt so that that's 105 percent because the the total capital doesn't cover certain uh certain uh, costs that are associated with the business is not the complete uh, value of the business um but this number you want the gearing to actually be low so anything about 50 percent gearing is is very high so uh that's again something to look at when you're investing you don't really want to invest in a company with very high gearing because as I said, you'd just be investing in uh, in loans. Do you want to do this one? Um, total debt minus cash divided by EBITDA. Yeah, sure. So um, total debt minus cash, um, that's another way, that's a fancy way of saying net debt divided by EBITDA shows how many years it would take a company to pay back its debt if net debt and EBITDA are held constant. So um, basically you're, basically what it is, is it's what it says on the tin. You're holding net debt, you're holding EBITDA constant. And then you're dividing through to see um, how long a, a company can take to pay back, pay back, pay back its debt. Um, perfect. Okay. Um, do you have anything to add to that, or should we just, you know, do a bit of trivia with the operating? Um, I think I think what we'll do is I'll spend five minutes talking about the filter, and then okay, if, at the last ten minutes, if if there's not really any questions about this stuff, we'll cover the last part. Okay? Perfect. Um, perfect. so going on to the filter, um. I'm going to start off with the very basics. So let's say I want to invest in a certain sector. I can choose that certain industry. Um, you can also play around with the analyst recommendations, but I, I wouldn't recommend using those because the analyst recommendations are very subjective and it's better to make your own decisions. You can see IPO dates, so how, how long ago the company became public, size, how big I want to invest in. So let's say if I want to, to take on a bit more risk but more return i'll go for smaller companies bigger companies are usually more stable but then your return isn't as high i can uh, see the exchange obviously so do i want to invest in dollars or pounds or, or what kind of currency i want to use um and then yeah you can you can select country and you can even see if it's up you have options which are basically you have you don't have to so you have a right to buy this stock but you don't have to at a future date or short, which is the opposite of buying, you're selling, so you're, you're basically betting your, your money that the stock's going to go down in value. Um, you know what, we'll play we'll play a little game, we're going to go and screen a stock. So do, do you want to, James, do you want to screen a stock with me? Let's choose a, sure, choose okay. a stock. So uh, exchange, I don't really bother with. What, what kind of size should we go for? Let's go for Nano. No, no. Okay, that's very risky. <laughs> okay. Um, earnings date, I don't really play at. Target price, don't play with. Well, I don't recommend playing with because again, it's subjective. It's just the target that you've been given. Index, don't really care. Dividend yield uh, depends on how you you want dividend or not. I don't really care about that. Again, average volume, how much the stock is traded. Um, Again, it's it's up to you. Sometimes you want to go into a stock that is highly traded because that means it's likely to grow in price. But uh, it could go the other way. So it might be traded a lot because people are trying to sell it. Um, 
IPO day, that's that's good to look at on a company, let's say, that's been around for five years, let's say. That's going to be quite hard to find with Nano, so I'm already down to 480. Um, what sector do you want, James? Let's do healthcare, because it's probably yeah. give yeah. us a great right. cohort. Keep it at that for now, because we're all running out of stocks already. So we'll go over to fundamentals. Um, first row, these are all uh, different comparable metrics, which I'm going to cover at a, another time um, that you can use to, to choose what you want. Uh, same with the second row, it's, it's to do with kind of growth. EPS growth, that's like earnings per share. So that's net income per share, basically. And uh, it's just the growth rate of it. So next year or any kind of forecasts are, are usually subjective. Again, you can't tell for sure how much it's going to grow in the next next year. So with these screeners, I, I recommend using actual data to pass performance. So let's say, how, how much growth do we want, James? Oof. Uh, something a bit reasonable, say under 10. Under 10, okay. We'll go over 5. <laughs> so yeah, next, I'm not, I don't use sales, that's just revenue. Anytime you hear sales, it's revenue, basically. Um, again, these are just different types of growth metrics. If you remember return on assets that we covered in the key metrics ratio part. Um, I, want, I want the uh, return on assets to be let's say 10 percent so that they give me good money and i'm already down to only two stops so there you go straight away we have two choices say that we can invest in for example i'm just gonna for the for the sake of it, i'm just gonna go for the rest of it return on equity we've done so much how much money you get for the equity that the company has uh, return on investment how much the investment return you get um current ratio we did quick ratio we did um debt to equity and to be fair, from the rest of the stuff here, we did. So as you can see, you can use this kind of um, filter to put in the key metric ratios that we covered um, to select the stock that you want. And then finally, you have a technical analysis, which again is another story it has to do with kind of charts. So how volatile the stock is. Um, if you're using indicators such as the RSI, where the stock's at right now. But technical analysis is, uh, again, pretty subjective and um out of the basically fundamental is probably the safest or, or best use and then technical is kind of good to to see what point you want to enter the trade so what what time is it a good time to this is like chart analysis so you want to see what when you want to enter the trade what what point in time so well we're not going to go through this because this is another topic for another time um so we have 10 minutes left so if you guys want to write in the chat if you have any questions uh, we'll try our best to answer them. Sure. In the meanwhile, um, you know, whilst questions pour in, we're just going to cover uh, just a little bit of trivia when it comes to some of the operating um, ratios. We didn't cover many operating ratios because they're not really, um, they are relevant in terms of analyzing a business. However, they're not really that relevant when it comes to um, picking a stock. So if you want to make a blanket stock pick, but if you want to go into detail and find out a bit more about the company, then these do become a bit more relevant. Now, um, you know, I'm going to cover something called revenue per employee. Now, um, just a little bit of trivia. Can you answer in the chat which company has more employees, Tesco or Apple? If you could answer that in the chat. Is everyone quiet or is the chat not working? <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Hey, we got two, three. one up, two Tesco's, three Tesco. All right, it's looking like it's Tesco. Oh no, a bit of Apple. Apple okay. as well. Right, should we, should we have a look? Apple. Okay. Perfect. So it looks like Tesco has all for three thousand. 
and Apple has. Yep, that's right. Apple has one, three, four thousand. So yeah, Tesco has more yeah. inputs. I mean, you'd think, you know, what you'd immediately think from the amount of revenue that Apple generates is that it has more employees, which is not really the case because a lot of it is outsourced and, you know, the production is outsourced to different companies across the world. Um, and also they don't hold, they, you know, companies like this, really, really big companies like this, try not to hold as many human assets or assets in general, physical assets in general. So, um that, that's a little bit of trivia there. And yep. um, again, you know, the, the ratio that this covers is revenue per employee. Yep. And, and now, just to mention, to, to compare the two, so this is what you want to do basically compared to companies. So if I look here, Tesco has uh, a lower um, revenue per employee compared to Apple. Like the Apple is way bigger. It's, at, um, it's nearly 2 million. Tesco's in 145. So what I'm trying to get here at, so is that right? Yeah. So what I'm trying to get here at basically is uh, with the amount of employees, this is like assets, basically employees are assets at a company with the amount of employees that the company has, they can make how much money they can make. Okay, And clearly Apple is able to make a lot more money. Yeah. I think, you know, re you know, reducing the number amount, the number of employees that they actually have, you know, and outsourcing their production has helped them boost their revenue per employee and boost revenue in general. Whereas, you know, with companies like Tesco's, it's not really possible because you really need, you know, you know, people in your stores. You really, you know, you it's a people's business more than Apple is, where which is a tech business. Okay, um, I don't see that we have any questions, so I'm just going to finish sure. with uh, how you represent this kind of information on uh, a presentation with the operating side of it. So here is the total revenue, uh, EBITDA, and net income. And basically the margins would be the, the gaps in between all of them. What you're trying to do is basically have a company that's that's growing, like these are, so steady line going upwards. And you want the gaps in between to be steady as well. So I don't want a sudden gap, let's say, between revenue and EBITDA, because then that means something happened there, something you know sudden. It's not a steady investment then, okay? I want it to be steady. Sorry, Ben, we have a quick question. Do you also do DCF analysis when analyzing stock fund fundamentally? Is it needed? DCF is probably the single most important tool that we use uh, within um, when analyzing a stock. All these ratios that we covered, um, they are very, very relevant to DCF analysis and also other analysis that we're going to cover in later workshops. So um, DCF is very, very important yep. in, ter in terms of analyzing the stock. And it's also preferable to other methods such as Monte Carlo simulation and other sort of um, other analysis that are used simply because the DCF analysis takes into consideration, you know, the the value of the company itself, what it's doing, um, you know, the spending that it's making, etc. Whereas Monte Carlo simulation only takes into account historical fluctuations, which can be due to you know industry wide factors or um, how the index is doing. Um, ben, do you want um, to yeah. add to that? So, to, to, with DCF, um, first of all, to mention. Uh, DCF is very useful, but then uh, it's also very time consuming. So it will take you a couple of days to put a DCF, a proper DCF together in a company. Um, it's, but if you do do it, it's, it's a very detailed analysis from your assumptions and perspectives on the company. So it's a, if you're going to, let's say you have a company that you really want to invest in, it's worth the time. But if I'm investing in a lot of different companies, it, I won't have time to do a DCF on all of them. So when I'm analyzing, when I'm filtering down here, I'm going to play along with the numbers that I think are ideal for my investment, okay? So in a sense, I am doing a DCFA, but much more simplified, okay? So if I'm selecting a lot of different stocks, let's say in my DCF, I want the growth rate to be a certain percentage. I want the reinvestment to be a certain percentage. I want the company to be this big. I want the free cash flows to be a certain growth rate. You can play around with those percentages here in a filter. And then... If it just filters down to one or two companies, then go ahead and do do a DCF on it because then you do uh, have the option to figure out if this is a good worthwhile investment. But when you're just kind of figuring out which stock you want to invest in, you have to use a filter because otherwise, if I don't and I'm just picking random stocks, I'll take a lot of time, you know, long time to produce DCF after DCF of loads of different companies. So first, make sure you have that kind of basic overview of the company and know that this is a good investment and then you make a DCF and uh, understand, you know, what, what, what the exact uh, details are of that. So I'm just going to quickly show you um, the rest of it. So 
Another good thing to have, for example, ROE. I want the ROE to kind of grow over time, as you can see here. So 2016, 2017, 2018. That's a good, you know, it's, it's growing, it's, it's doing better compared to the industry median. Uh, no worries. Uh, compared to the industry median, um, it's, it's higher. So again, uh, a good, nice way to look at it. And same with the uh, current ratio and debt to equity. So that's kind of how you uh, look at um, the kind of slides for, for these um, stocks. Yeah. Is there any tool that could be used to analyze stocks using DCF Monte Carlo? Um, so with the with these with these kind of valuation models such as the DCF such as the Monte Carlo um, it's not really a tool uh, you can't a tool but it's a model and the they're they're subjective so you usually build it yourself so all the big banks have their own kind of models or the analysts produce their own kind of versions and that's because when you let's say I'm invested in Apple I have my own assumptions personally. So I think this is how well Apple will do in the future. This is how much it will grow. This is how much debt to equity it will have, etc. So, and then also what factors I want to count into it. So let's say, do I include option value? Do I include restricted stock grants? Do I include um, restricted cash? So it's, it's up to kind of your perspective and what you include in these models and they're very subjective. So there is not a universal kind of tool that you can use. Uh, what you can do is uh, go online and I can send you a link to a lecture that goes into detail quite a bit with this. Uh, but you, you got to learn it yourself and then make up your own opinions on it. And then you can produce your own kind of models and everything. Um, do you have anything else to add, James? Because I think we'll end here. Um, um, no, I, I, I don't have anything to add um, at the moment to this. Okay. Um, thanks, Ben. But nice. um, are you sending the PDF um, via email, or are you going to be putting it? Yeah, in the so chat? so I'll I'll put the for, for those of you watching live, I'll put the PDF of the different ratios into the chat. If you're watching the recording, uh, just send me an email. You can see at the bottom right of the screen, and I'll send you the document. So with that, thank you very much for joining, and I hope you found this useful. And also thank you for James for joining as well and giving me a hand with everything. Perfect. Um, thank. Um, thanks, Ben. Um, again, just, just a few things to add. I think I've put the um, link to one or two of our social media channels. Again, feel free to follow our YouTube channel as well, or Facebook if you don't do already. And we're posting some really good stuff there about our global initiative, um, about our partnerships with different universities and different think tanks to really, you know, give our members, you know, greater value. So, um, you know, feel free to join as a member. You can find information on the Lusu page. And um, yeah, that's it for me. Perfect. Um, thanks, Ben. Thank you. See you later. See you later, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.